the thing about work is one is to see it as drudgery as, as drudgery as our lot after the fall of humankind work is something that we are we have to do because we are we are fallen that is one aspect of work the or one way of understanding work another way of understanding work is to see it as something as the only and the most important thing in in in, in the world and just to to live and die for work and and with our work only it seems to me that both uh, of these understandings of work are, uh, are, are mistaken. <clears throat> From a Christian perspective, work is something that God has given us, and, God, and actually it is God's first commandment to, to human beings. And, and actually I feel that a lot of problems in Nagaland, a lot of problems would be solved if only we obey God's first commandment to human beings, which is, to, to be fruitful, to multiply, to take care of the garden with what God has, has given us. And because we have, we, we have not obeyed God's first commandment to Adam and Eve in Nagaland, or a lot of us Nagas, a lot of problems have, have arisen. But at the same time, there is a certain uh, drudgery about work. It is difficult, you know, we don't get up on Monday morning saying, yay, thank God it's Monday. We, we, we struggle with that, and, 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 and rightly so. There is something painful about work. Now, how do we approach work? What, what I want to share with you, and then we will open it up for discussion. What I want to share with you is, uh, I will use the word tips in approaching work. First, and, and I will just use, for, for ease of remembrance, I will use the, the letter C in each First, approach work as a calling. That will help you in, in, in your work. When you approach work as a calling. Now, what is a calling? Calling is, some, it, it, it is the, the old word is, is vocation. As a vocation by God. Many of us, I want to ask you this morning, how many of you, you are teaching here, how many of you can really say, that what you are doing is, you see it as a calling, as a calling. Can you honestly say that? If you know what your calling is, then it will make a lot of difference. Or if you realize that what you are doing here is really your calling, it will make a world of difference in the way you approach work. You know, in the medieval times, people understood calling in a very uh, truncated and mistaken way. In medieval times, only the monks and the priests, those who, who were in so-called full-time Christian work or Christian ministry, were understood as, as those who were called by God. But when the Reformation took place, the reformers, they came in and they said, no. Everyone is called by God. It is not just the priest or the evangelist or the pastor or someone, a missionary who is called by God. An administrator, a magistrate, a soldier, a businessman can be called by God. And it was the Reformation that kind of democratized this idea of, of calling. And historians will today say that out of the five uh, slogans of the Reformation. The Reformation were, was based on five slogans, five solas. One, sola scriptura, scripture alone. Two, sola gratia, grace alone, God's grace alone. Three, sola fide, faith alone will save us. Four, solus Christus, Christ alone is the Savior. And the fifth one is soli deo gloria, to the glory of God alone. That was the fifth pillar of the Reformation. And historians today will say that it was the Reformation, whether you're Christian or not, you will have to concede that it was the Reformation that gave rise to the modern world, that produced the modern world. And how is this so? 
And how did this happen? This happened because when people went out into the world, they, they, as, a business, as business people, they said, this is my calling. This is what God has called me to do. Business is my calling. Politicians who went out into the world and said, this is God's calling upon my life and I want to do it faithfully unto God. Coram Deo, the Latin phrase is Coram Deo. It is before the face of God, doing everything as unto the Lord, as called by God. Many of us, we think religious work or spiritual work is the kind of work or sacred work is the kind of work that we do in church or that religious, the, the typical religious work. Christianity actually says no. You know, with every other worldview, even among a, a lot of Christians, the more a spiritual, the more spiritual a person is, the less this worldly he or she becomes. But Christian spirituality is quite the reverse. At the heart, at the heart of the Christian faith is the claim that the word, the immaterial, became flesh, became material. So this world is spiritual, it is sacred. So my work as a pastor or my work as an evangelist or my work as something uh, in religious work is no more sacred than the work of a farmer. No more sacred than the work of a housewife. And I think this is something that we need to recapture if there has to be dynamism in our work. Seeing our work as calling. One of the best books that I can recommend on calling is, maybe some of you have even come across this, is uh, uh, the book by Os Guinness, one of our senior colleagues in RZIM. And he defines calling in this way. Calling is the truth that God has called us so decisively to himself that everything we are, everything we do, and everything we have is invested with a special devotion and dynamism and lived as a response to God and his summons. Think about it. Everything that we have, everything that we are, everything that we do is unto God. We need to break down this false dichotomy and false compartmentalization between the sacred and the secular. This, the opposite of sacred is not secular. The opposite of sacred is sin. It is not secular. So your work, you must see this work, your work here. If, if it is God's call upon you, you must see it as your calling. And you must live it as unto the Lord. Abraham Kuyper, one of the uh, great Christian leaders of the, of the 19th century. He was a statesman, he was a poet, he was a publisher, a theologian, uh, even a politician, and he went on to become the, the Prime Minister of Holland. He, he was the one who founded the Free University of Amsterdam, which is one of the leading universities in Europe today, Free University. Abraham Kuyper, he said, there is not a single square inch in the whole of human existence over which Christ does not claim mine. So everything, he says, belongs to Christ. And your work is a call by God in, in Christ. So understanding your work as, as calling. But the question still is, how, how do I know what, it, what my calling is? It's, it's not easy, you know. For some people, they know it early on. Most people will know it in the middle of their lives. Some people will know it at the <laughs> end of their lives. They look back and they say, ah, you know, this was how my life panned out and that was my, my, my calling. And there's no strict formula as such about finding our calling. 
But calling is basically doing what you are. You know, what is it that makes you, you? When are you most alive? When are you most you? Who are you? What makes you tick? What makes you tick? And some years back, I, I had the privilege of hearing the uh, famous pastor Rick Warren. And I, I think I've even read this in, 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 in one of his books, but I definitely heard him say this. <coughs> and he was talking about Moses, about how Moses found his uh, found the call of God or heard the call of God. When God called Moses to, to lead the Israelites out of Egypt and Moses was negotiating with God, trying to refuse God, trying to decline the call and God tells Moses, Moses, what is in your hand? And Moses says, a staff. I have a staff. God tells Moses, throw down the staff throws it down, it turns into a snake, pick it up again, and he picks it up again, and it be becomes a staff again. And Rick Warren, this famous pastor, he said, what did that staff of Moses represent? What did that stick represent? He said it represented three things. One, it represented his identity. Identity. It said who Moses was. Who was he? He was a shepherd. His identity. Number two, it represented his income. How did he earn his living? He earned his living by being a shepherd, by looking up the sheep, his income. Number three, it represented his influence. What did he influence? Or the, the field of his influence. Identity, income, influence. And God says, lay down your identity, your income, your influence. And he lays it down. Pick it up again and then he picks it up. Laying it down before God. And then picking up, picking it up again. And it's very interesting. Until that episode, that staff is called the staff of Moses. But after that episode, Moses starts performing miracles with that staff. Great things with the staff. He hits the rock and water gushes out. He hits the sea, the sea parts. And it is also, it is no longer called the staff of Moses after that. It is called the rod of God. And Rick Warren asked us, and this applies to, to, to all of us, or in fact he told us, you know, when he would talk to this NBA, great all-star NBA uh, basketball players, he would ask them, what is in your hand? A basketball. That's your identity, your income, and your influence. And in the same way, maybe I can ask you today, what is in your hand? And you will say, a pen. That's your identity. That's your income. That's your influence. Maybe that's your calling. What do you have? What do you have? So calling, number one, calling. Number two is what I would call collaboration. Approaching your work as collaborating with God and with other people. You know, one of the things that you'd notice, and again, please do pardon me, I'm a theologian, <laughs> so I, I, I try to approach things uh, basically from a theological and a Christian perspective. <clears throat> One thing in the Bible, again and again, that you notice is whenever God has something to do in this world, He always uses human beings. And I don't know why, but it is always human beings. God created the world. Someone had to tend it. He creates Adam and Eve. The world goes wrong. In order to solve the problem of the world, he calls who? Abraham. The people of Israel, they are in Israel and they are in slavery. They cry out to God. And it's very interesting. In the book of Exodus, God says, I have heard the cry of my people. 
I have seen the misery of my people. I am coming down to help them. Very interesting. God says, I am coming down to help them. And then he, what does he do? He says, Moses, come over here. I'll send you. Again and again. It is always human beings. To the point that ultimately he himself comes down in person. How? Again as a human being in Jesus of Nazareth, according to Christian belief. And somehow, somehow, it is very mysterious. God wants to collaborate with us. Everything that is done in this world is done by God, but through human agents. Never in my life has an angel come down and made my bed. Except maybe... But it, yeah, in some ways, my wife qualifies as an angel. <laughs> but never. No, God is not going to come down and clean that garbage. We have to do it. This building, we have to build it. And when you're building it, when you're building this infrastructure, or whatever, when you're building students, when you see that as collaborating with God, it will make a world of difference. And one of the things is, in the end, in the end, the things that we humans do will also last. It's very interesting. The Bible begins in a garden, and then it moves, moves in Genesis 1 and 2. Towards the end, Je Revelation 21 and 22, where does it end? It ends in a city. But it is not just a city. It is a garden city. Garden is the work of God. City is the work of human beings. And in the end, we have a garden city. A coming together, an integration of the work of God and the work of God. And I don't know how it will be, but the work that you are doing, as a teacher, it may, it may sound, it may be boring, there may be times where you are frustrated, there will be times when you doubt your calling and, you, and your work, you may be, but whatever it is, when you believe that you are collaborating with God and that it has eternal significance, it will help you. You know, it, it will switch on something. Th that mindset will switch you on. Collaboration. Collaboration with God. Collaborating with other people also. Third is consistency. Excellence in work, consistency. We just can't do it without consistency. Ono, my wife Ono and I, we... <laughs> we have this inside joke, which has now passed on to our eldest son also. It's, you know, we, we don't want to look down or, or, or mock anyone, but, you know, we Nagas, uh, when we open a shop, you know, the names of our shops are, they sound very exotic. They usually are very exotic. And the boards that we put up are also very impressive. The font, everything is well designed. And the names are also Latin or Spanish or whatever. Very well, well done. And but uh, our friends from the mainland, they're, they're, it'll be Papu Medical or MS Panchop or whatever. The name will be, and it will be just simply written. Now, when we start, we start very well. Bam. But we somehow lack this basic consistent work every day manning the song and and our inside joke is usually and, and you you try and observe it when the board is very impressive the name of the shop is very impressive usually it'll be upstairs downstairs will be taken by the uh, non-locals because the rent is higher the upstairs the rent is a little lower so it'll be taken and then the shutters will always be down almost always be, be down and one of our biggest problems is inconsistency. Inconsistency. Whatever it is. 
in far too many areas we are inconsistent. And I think this is something that we really, really need to, to learn. Nothing worthwhile is achieved without consistent perseverance. I would really recommend this book that I just read very recently. I just completely came out a long time back. I don't know how I missed it all these years. Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell. How many of you have read that? You must have read it, yeah. Outliers, Mal Malcolm Gladwell. And in, in that book, Malcolm Gladwell, and he's a beautiful writer, he has a chapter called the 10,000 hour rule. 10,000 hour rule. And basically, you can find it on YouTube, but read it, uh, it's better if you read it. The 10,000 hour rule basically says, and, and he brings together all this research that uh, researchers have, d have done, and he says that today, researchers have kind of zeroed in or centered on the number of hours that you need to put in in order to become a world-level expert. If you want to become a world-level expert in anything or something, you will need to put in 10,000 hours of practice, which is roughly about 10 years of three hours or so. You, 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 you do the math. Uh, so you need to be, if you just put in that consistent work, then you grow. The problem with us is many times we just want that immediate breakthrough. But life, life isn't like that. Life isn't like that. My sons, they do Taekwondo. And it's, you know, watching them do, it's just the drill, the basic drill of kick, 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 kick. But slowly, slowly they develop. One of them has become a black belt. You know. The other two are also catching up. Or you do music, even music, it has to be consistent practice. So whatever it is that you are doing, whether it is through your research, your teaching, and I know some of you have done PhDs, some of you have done research, MPhils, some of you are in the process of doing your PhDs. <laughs> it is the most, you know, for me it was the heaviest load I ever carried in my life. Yeah. But you need to, you need to produce that big, ugly, fat, black book at the end of it. And how do you write it? You can't write it overnight. You have to produce something every, every day. You know, one, one man, during my PhD research, something that I read that really helped me was what a writer uh, suggested about writing. He said, write 500 words a day. 500. If you write 500 words consistently every day, that's enough. That's more than enough. And this guy, he followed his own advice and he ended up writing 25 books in his lifetime. Just writing 500 words consistently. Now, if only we could follow that. I'm also trying to write something cons consistently, but you know, uh, I, I fail more and more often than not, but consistency. So third is consistency. Fourth related to that is also commitment. It is related to consistency, but approaching work as part of your commitment to God. And I say this because it's very interesting that in, in, in the Bible, when the Apostle Paul, he advised these servants who work in other people's homes, when he gave instructions to the servants, he did not tell the servants to tell their masters about God, to talk about God, to do all of this, you know, religious work, or to evangelize, or to missionize, or proselytize these people, or to convert their masters. His advice to them in Colossians, for example, Colossians chapter 3 was, do your work sincerely as a servant, as a slave, as unto the Lord. Not just as eye pleasers before your masters, but do it as a commitment unto the Lord, knowing that you have a master in heaven who will reward you. That God will reward you for 
sweeping the floor. Now what's the connection? I don't know. But there's this book, and I, and I would recommend this book. I read this again about three weeks back, and it, it'll take you only about two hours to read through that whole book. It's called Practicing the Presence of God. You might want to pick it up. I read this many years, more, more than 20 years ago, but I, I did not really appreciate it then. Just three weeks back, I reread it, and boom, this book hit me. This book is about a, a, a monk in the 17th century. His name was Brother Lawrence. He was an awkward, ungainly uh, person, very clumsy person. But he gave his life to be a monk and he went and lived in the monastery to, to come closer to God. But he found out that in the monastery, he struggled with distractions. He struggled with his prayer life. He did not find God in the monastery. He thought he would find God. And for the first 15 years of his life in the monastery, his job was to work in the kitchen. 15 years, this monk had to work in the kitchen. But then something clicked. And Brother Lawrence, what he did was, he said, whatever I do, I will do it as unto the Lord, in the presence of God for the love of God or as a sign of my commitment to God and then he started practicing that to the point he, he, he says I would even pick up a straw a, a straw while he's cleaning I would pick, even pick up a straw unto God and when he did that his perspective changed not just his perspective, his whole demeanor changed. His life changed. So much so that the other people in the monastery, they started asking him, Brother Lawrence, what has happened to you? There's something different about you. What is it that you are doing differently? What has happened to you? We want that secret. And Brother Lawrence would say, there's no secret. No, 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 there's a secret. What is it? And he said, well, I do everything unto the Lord. I clean the, sweep the floor unto the Lord. I peel and dice the potato unto the Lord. And the others were also influenced. Then other people outside the monastery, they heard, started hearing about Brother Lawrence. They started coming to the monastery to learn from Brother Lawrence. And so there's no secret. It's simple, simply this, unto the Lord. People started writing to him. And he wrote back, and someone kind of compiled it, his letters. And that is how we have the book, Practicing the Presence of God. If only you can, whatever that you are doing, take it as unto the Lord. That will really change your perspective. Four, approach your work with a conscience. Having a conscience. Or is it the fifth one here? Yeah. Conscience. And I think this is something that is desperately needed all over the world, and especially in London. We are at a point, we are at a ridiculous point right now where everything has broken down. Well, what the PAC has been doing, I mean, the, the irony of it all, you must have heard of the Public Action Committee comprising volunteers from different tribes going and manning these check gates all around Dimapur. And suddenly the price of pota potatoes has come, has halved. And it is, you know, the, the public are, have to go and check this, not just the, uh, the different political groups, but the government agencies. Yes, we have a lot of systemic problems, but at the root of it is a problem of conscience. Somehow we have lost our conscience. And we need to regain that conscience. And it begins with you. It begins with me. Having a conscience before God. Saying, no, 
I cannot. I can't. I was just speaking to a some, someone I know who is hi, highly placed uh, in, in the government. And this person was telling me, someone was trying to you know, get a bill done and said, you will also get your, your cut. And this person said, just told me on my way back, I was speaking to this person. And this person said, I will not do it. I get my salary, I will not take it. I don't want that extra cut. And whether you are in the private sector, whether you are in multinational companies, whether you are in the government sector or in, in, a, in a college like this, there will be many times when you will have to draw your lines in terms of your conscience. Learn to draw your lines. Learn to say, no, this I cannot do. The story is told of a of a young man who was uh, an upright man. And for his first job, he, he was working for a very rich businessman. Very rich, very powerful man. And he was very sincere in his work. All he had to do was to be uh, this man's receptionist or his peon, as it were. <laughs> One day a phone call came and the other guy on on uh, the other end said, is your boss in? I want to speak to him. And this young man said, yes, he's in. I'll give the phone to him. Uh, and told his boss, sir, such and such is on the line. He wants to speak to you. His boss said, no, 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 no. Tell him I'm not here. I don't want to talk to him. Tell him I'm not here. And he told his boss, this young man said, no, sir, I cannot lie. You are here. I will not lie. Boss was really mad, picked up the phone, spoke to him, banged the phone, turned to this young man and said, you're fired. But before I fire you, you must know whatever I say you do, I'm your boss. No, you are fired. Young man said, sir, that's fine. But before I leave, can I tell you something? Boss said, go ahead. So I did not lie for you. Because if I lie for you today, I will lie to you tomorrow. If I lie for you today, I will lie to you tomorrow. And a lot of our problems, honestly, a lot of our problems would be solved if only we took truth seriously. If we simply care to be truthful. You know, I did a some time back, I did a small kind of a research, not even a research, a Google thing about yes and no. Jesus said, let your yes be yes, let your no be no. Very simple. If it's yes, say yes. If it's no, say no. Very simple. And I checked uh, the, the, the words for yes and no in the various languages of the world. And in almost all the languages of the world or in most languages of the world, both yes and no are monosyllable. Just one one syllable. Yes, no. In my language, it's u, mo. Yes, no. If, and the thought that occurs to me is, if only we can get these first two monosyllables right in our lives, a lot of things would be smoother. Approach your work with a conscience. And finally, I, I end with this. Approach your, your work also in communion with God. Communion. Learn to pray about your work. Learn to be in touch with God in your work. And it will make a lot of difference. In 2004, I, I had the privilege of <clears throat> uh, being one of the praise and worship leaders in, a, in the uh, Baptist World Alliance Centenary Congress 2004. The Baptist World Alliance was founded in 1904 and the first conference was in 1904. So 2004 was the Centenary Congress and I was invited, I don't know why, <laughs> But I was invited to be also to be one of the praise and worship leaders, and it was a conference 
you know, with thousands of people in a huge arena. And every night, every morning, every night, we, we led uh, the, the singing. One evening, one evening, the speaker was President Jimmy Carter, who's also a Baptist, the former president of, of the United States, and he was the speaker. And we were on stage, and you know, the delegates were all seated, people all around the, this arena. Jimmy Carter was in the front row with all the other dignitaries and other Christian leaders and other leaders. And Jimmy Carter was to come up to speak. We had led the worship and singing. We sat down, someone had come up to pray before uh, President Jimmy Carter came up to speak. And from the stage, you know, everyone had their eyes closed. I was on stage, you know, I kind of opened my eyes and I just peeped through my fingers. And I saw Jimmy Carter, President Jimmy Carter seated there. And what impressed me so much, it was his body. But of all the people in that arena, Jimmy Carter was the one whose head was bowed the lowest. You know, he was like this. He was an old man. He was bowed down like this in prayer. And that, that really made an impression on me. By any account, he was the most important man there. But he was also the man who was bowing the lowest before God in prayer. A few years back, I was in a conference in, in Singapore. <clears throat> it was a small conference, and one of the speakers, he, he gave his talk, and what he said in, in this talk impressed me so much. So I met him after the talk, I got to know him, and then later came back, I wrote to him an email and I said, your talk impressed me so much, can you send me the talk that you gave? And he emailed me, and this is what he wrote. He, he said this, prayer is fundamental to the Christian way of life. I came to know Christ in 1976 when I was going to university. Initially, I prayed earnestly about everything. However, gradually, as I gained ascendancy in the government hierarchy, I began to rely more and more on my own efforts and intelligence. I would say that I did this for about half my public service career. I still went to church, I still prayed, but in day-to-day -day life, I tried to solve problems on my own. Life still worked, but it was more hard going. This carried on until one day in 2004, a senior pastor of a church encouraged me to form a prayer group among the leaders in the government, and I did so with some other people. This became a tremendous blessing Basically, I relearned the centrality of prayer in the Christian life. The Lord answered all our prayers, sometimes perhaps not according to our preferences, but always the Lord provided an answer, a solution, and a way out. It, it doesn't sound too remarkable until you hear who this man is. This man was the former chief secretary of Hong Kong the top civil servant in Hong Kong. And Hong Kong is not a, you know, it, it, I, I think per capita it has the most number of billionaires in the world. A major, and he was the chief secretary. And he resigned his post, and then he, he also, you know, became a, became a, a preacher. But as a chief, as chief secretary, as a civil servant, he's talking about the importance of, of prayer. If someone like Jimmy Carter, someone like the Chief Secretary is talking about the importance of prayer in the work life, how much more people like us. So I leave these five or six things with you. Calling, collaboration with God, consistency, commitment, conscience, and, and communion. I hope, you know, even if you did not get too much out of it, maybe something here or there, a, a crumb 
will fall off the <laughs> table and, and, and you know, it will benefit you. Thank you so much. Yeah, maybe we'll open time for discussion. Thank you. Mm.